Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Marty Heiser Show. Obviously, I'm not Marty Heiser. I don't look like I'm at all. Um, I'm Al Robinson. I am the owner of Hat City Blog, and I'm going to be the host for this, today's edition of the show. Uh, Marty's out doing his thing out in Ridgefield, and he will be back next week. Um, but we have a nice show tonight. Um, of course, right now is the campaign season, which I like to call as the silly season. And from time to time, we're going to have candidates running who are running for uh, municipal positions, whether it's for first selectmen, mayor, board of education. We're going to have them all come on to the show and talk about their platforms and why they're running. Last week, we had um, Bob Burke, who is running under the Connecticut Tea Party position in Bessel. Um, we also have Bob Cernick, who's running for selectmen as well. They're running on the same ticket in Bessel. Um, hopefully in time, we were supposed to have Matt Knickerbocker, who was the first selectman of Bessel to come on today. But unfortunately, he couldn't make it because of the um, pending hurricane that's coming um, right now. So he had to take care of business in Bessel, which is quite understandable. And we'll have Mr. Knickerbocker on later on. And hopefully we'll also have the Republican candidate for first selectman, Kevin Cleary, um, come on the show also because we love Bessel a lot on this show. But today... Nobody from Bethel, but we have somebody from Danbury, and it's one of my favorite politicians in Danbury, and Mark Bowton's big nightmare. We have uh, tonight um, the Democratic candidate for mayor, Lynn Tabersack. Lynn, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's great to be here. All right. And yeah, you are running for mayor of Danbury, but of course you have had, you've been in Danbury for a very long time, doing politics for a very long time. So for the new people of Danbury, and of course the show is going not only in the greater Danbury area, but it's actually going all the way throughout Fairfield County now because we're picked up on Cablevision as well wow. as um, yeah. Charter Communications, so it's a little outside the Danbury area. So for people not familiar with you, can you just give us a brief background of your resume? Sure. I'm, uh, I'm uh, one of Danbury's unique uh, <laughs> <laughs> homebred uh, uh, originals, uh, so that I've, I was born in Danbury, I've lived here all my life. Um, graduated from Danbury High School. I know school is starting next week for many students, yeah. and I think back of uh, when I started high school in Danbury, it was the first year of split sessions. Mm -hmm. And it was, of course, at the old White Hall, which is now the wow. Midtown campus at Westcon. But you could say that um, Forty years ago, uh, people in Danbury, the political landscape wasn't smart enough to figure out that they needed to build some new schools. Right. And we're almost back in that situation again. But uh, So I've been in Danbury a long time, served in the legislature for four terms, served on the city council uh, for a term in uh, 2005 to 2007, ran for Congress, was not successful in that. Right. Um, I have a son who's involved in politics. He's the current representative for the 109th district. A great state but, rep. Yeah, <laughs> but um, I like to get my hand in a lot of things beside politics. I'm very active with the uh, soup kitchen on Spring Street. I'm very active with the farmer's market. Uh, last Friday, if you went to the farmer's market, you would have seen me dressed as a banana. <laughs> we had kids uh, coming from the Y, the program that the Y runs, uh, mm -hmm. trying to teach them uh, the importance of eating fruits and veggies. Uh, so I was a banana. I was a bunch of grapes. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, also, the community garden. I think people know we have a community garden behind the Hispanic Center. I've been very involved in that and with the Association of Religious Communities. I help them do outreach to the immigrant community. We like to keep our ears and eyes open and find out if people are having difficulties being assimilated in Danbury. So I'm a community activist, a volunteer involved in politics, involved in a lot of the uh, uh, social service programs that help people. So you, you have a very, you've had a very, very active role in Danbury. Um, I like to think I, I come to the uh, mayoral race with the same qualifications that um, Mark 
did when he first ran for mayor. I've been a public school teacher. Uh, that was my original training. And let's see, what else do we have in common? I was a member of the legislature. Right. Um, the mayoral job now, though, uh, the city of Danbury, I believe, is the fifth or sixth largest employer. Um, our city government is now a, a big business, and you need good people to run it. And I think... Um, I think in some cases he doesn't have the best people. I'd like to see Al Baker get a one-way ticket right back to Wisconsin. I think he's been <laughs> awful for our police department. Well, you, you've been in Danbury for a very long time. You've seen Danbury grown from what it was back in the 60s until it was incorporated into a city, from the town of Danbury, the city of Danbury, to actually the city of Danbury. Um, and now it's the seventh largest city in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. um, so you've seen a lot. So. Tell me briefly, why do you want to run for mayor? Well, you know, I didn't start out life saying I want to be mayor of the city of Danbury. Uh, sometimes things happen that put you in those positions where I would say to um, residents in Danbury, it is very important for you to have a choice uh, this November. I think Mark has gotten too big for his britches, and I think that there has to be a real campaign about issues and that people will have a choice when they go to the polls. I think you've seen that in many of the surrounding towns, and it's a disease on both sides of the aisle, that we are having the highest elected position in many of the surrounding towns go unchallenged. And that's very, very unhealthy for democracy. Yeah. I, I suppose I can put on my League of Women Voters hat. Yeah. I've been involved with the League for years and years and years, but it's that, that, that principle that people need to have a voice every November. And if they don't have candidates to vote for, uh, shame on us. And if they don't vote, shame on them. I always tell people, if you don't vote, uh, don't come and complain about the results on November 9th. Yeah, absolutely. I don't want to hear about it. Absolutely. I, I, I tell people all the time, if you don't vote, keep your mouth <laughs> shut because you didn't do anything to help out the process. Um, what are some of the major issues you see happening in this city that you think will be um, on the front burner in this campaign season? I know that we have, for instance, let me just throw one out at you. School starting next week. Mm -hmm. um, I've been very involved over the years in terms of uh, following the Board of Education, learning about what's happening in education. I have a daughter who's going to be entering kindergarten, so I have to be much more involved mm -hmm. about education. So um, give me your thoughts about the state of education in Danbury right now. Well, I'm very concerned about the state of education in Danbury. I think it's at a tipping point where really the system could go, it could tip in the right direction or the wrong direction. And uh, I think that every election year uh, when school starts, and there's a municipal election that Mark will send out this postcard, <laughs> giving himself a report card, right. and giving himself an A plus for education. Yeah. And uh, uh, it ain't necessarily so. And right. I think we have to we have to really give him some um, some bad marks. He's gotten some Fs, and uh, he does it uh, he does it because he likes to use code words. He likes to appeal to people's like negative instincts and I when I think about uh, I think it was in 2008 when the administrators in the Denver Public Schools separated from the teachers union right. Uh, right. in the past you would have principals and teachers all in the same bargaining unit but right. they separated and these administrators uh, organized into their own union and, and um, actually negotiated for a contract where where they uh, were compared. Uh, and there were tremendous inequities so that you would see the principal at Shelter Rock and the principal at Park Avenue had vast differences in their salaries, but yeah. they had 300 kids and all the same responsibilities. And he called them administrators. This is an administrator's contract. They're getting too much. They aren't administrators. Julia Horn is the principal of a school. She's right. the face that greets the kids every single day when that place is open. Uh, Dave Craffick mm -hmm. isn't an administrator. He's the principal of Park Avenue School. He's going right. to welcome the kids uh, to a picnic. Uh, 
usually the uh, day before school starts at right. that school and let them see their classroom and meet their teachers. So by calling them administrators, what he actually did was he got the council to reject their contract, their first contract, the one that evened, evened out some of the real inequities uh, right. uh, that, that existed, especially for the elementary school principals, and uh, sent it to um, binding arbitration, <laughs> which is the other word that really gets people aggravated. Yeah. But I, I think the amount of money that was involved was about 45000 um, and that would have fixed things for, um, I believe it was a three-year contract, and it cost them 35000 to go through arbitration because, because you have to pay for it. You have to, when you go to binding arbitration, when, when you go to that level, you have to pay for legal fees and things of that matter, so yeah. it doesn't so, really work So out. it's silly. It's silly right. to, to uh, say we can't afford this and then to spend twice that amount. Um, because that doesn't help the Denver Public Schools. I think the biggest problem um, that we've had is that th this whole idea of buying the Emanuel Lutheran School, this was all during uh, Mark's uh, administration. It was in 2004 when the contract was signed. And uh, very unusual circumstances. Uh, Faith Academy was operating up on Clappard Ridge. Yep. Emanuel Lutheran wanted to buy Faith Academy. Faith Academy wanted to go to New Milford and they had to find a buyer. And this was rushed through and it was proposed and swallowed as, well, it's a school and we're just going to keep it as a school and we'll move all 12 of the Head Start classrooms over there and free up space in our own elementary school so that we can offer all day kindergarten for right. kids like your daughter who are going to school. New Milford is doing it yeah. uh, this year. Danbury isn't, uh, we're not there. And that was one of Mark's campaign promises in his first run that he was gonna offer full-time kindergarten to, That's to where everybody we were in going. Danbury. That's where we were going. So uh, we had this uh, 2004, it's seven years later, um, the, uh, the the building was not inspected. They had a 10-day uh, window uh, to check to see if there were mechanical problems, to see if there was a mold problem, to see if there was asbestos problems. It wasn't done. It was a rush job. Right. And I think we've seen that uh, as a pattern. I know there was a rush to, to um, unload the old police station by June 30th. Right. Um, there's a rush this year to uh, sell the 13 acres. Uh, yeah. Uh, because it's in this year's budget and right. it's going to balance it. So we have uh, from 2004 to 2010, we have bonding in place. Uh, voters approved it. Uh, we got 3.2 million from the state in bonding and nothing happened. It just sat there and sat there and our schools got more and more crowded. Now what do you do when you have kids entering um, a building, an elementary school building, and there are no available classrooms. You increase your class size. And I think probably the most important thing for kids in kindergarten, first and second grade, is to have those small sizes. And Danbury's been committed to that. So Emmanuel Lutheran, a big boondoggle, sat on for too long. Space needs are awful. Shelter yeah. Rock, everybody is complaining. They have the art, I think it's called art, art on, on a cart. cart. Yeah. Music on a cart, everything on a cart. Yeah. And, and Mark says he's addressing it now. It's gone on too long and he only addresses things every two years. And it's, and it's rather funny. Um, I read his op-ed piece uh, as well as yours in the, in the News Times. And he's like, well, Danbury, we're going to get on the right path. I'm like, well, you've been in office for 10 years. You know, <laughs> where you been? You know, we have the, we have a situation. We have art on the cart. We have overcrowding. We have um, the, the, the laying off or the elimination of paraprofessionals and Terrible. kindergarten. And there's a reason why my daughter is going to private school as opposed to public school, because I'm very afraid of this, this situation in public school. I've been to enough board of ed meetings and hearing enough complaints and concerns from parents about the, the, inc the increase in sizing of, of schools and, and the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the cut of the education budget year after year. I think yeah. the, the education budget this year was 
yeah, 0.79 this year um, and zero last year. Yeah. And I, how many times can you do that and not have a, an awful, awful result in, in your classroom? It's, it's horrible. Especially when you have health care costs that you have to take into account yeah. for, for your things, employees. Things you, cost more. Things cost more. And, and the funny thing is, is that with this last budget where he gave uh, the schools a million dollars and he gave the city side um, was 5.3 or 5.4. But he said, it's not really, uh, that 5.4 isn't really a city cost. It's, uh, it's these recurring costs that, uh, that drive it up. It's not for really city services. And you look at the recurring costs and it's FICA and it's health benefits and right. it's pension benefits and they're for city workers so right. yes it does belong there yeah I and mean, if it's oh, if it's fair to do it on the city side what happens to the education yeah. side and it's the same, same the thing. other uh, interesting thing the other big F that Mark gets in education is this um, uh, move he made when uh, the the Board of Ed decided to give small increases to members of the superintendent's cabinet. Right. Now, Danbury has been shedding administrators, and zaluski has gone, this one's gone, that one's gone. So everybody's doing more, you know. They're all doing more jobs. And uh, the mayor got the council to take back, I think it was $35,300 from the education budget after it had already been appropriated. And it's for, for our audience, it's important for them to understand, um, from the city council, they allocate money to the Board of Education. To and use. Once, and once that money is given to the Board of Education, it's up to the Board of Education, who is a, a separate elected body. Mm -hmm. They can do whatever they want to do with that money, with the money. They can do whatever they want. And in my opinion, I think in the opinion of many, it's illegal for the city council to say, hey, wait a second, you're not doing what I want you to do, give me that money back. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is the only known occasion where this has happened in any municipality right. in the state of Connecticut. Uh, we asked CABE, uh, which is the Connecticut Association of Boards of Education, uh, you know, has this ever happened where there's been an appropriation, a budget given to a school board, and then the legislative body takes money back? Never happened. And uh, I'm disappointed that the school board chose not to uh, challenge it, not to ask CABE to challenge it, because it's an awful precedent. Right. It's an awful, awful precedent. And then you see, uh, right now we have all this controversy with the freshman sports. When you don't fund the school budget adequately, the board makes decisions based on what their highest priorities are. And I think maybe their highest priorities were more academic than sports. Um, but uh, now at the end of the year, the mayor has come up with a, with a way to fund freshman sports because there are parents who have been out there really knocking themselves out yes. raising money. And, and you know, I applaud them for, for their effort to do that. But it is not the mayor's role to tell the Board of Education what to spend money on. But he's talking about having the council give the Board of Education $57,000 to fund freshman sports. And that's, that's not how it works. Once the money is given, the Board of Ed may choose what it would like that money to be spent on. Maybe it wants to have three paraprofessionals uh, come back into the system. So right. he keeps intruding. I think he, um, he keeps overreaching really what his, what his power is as mayor. But it's very destructive, very destructive to the schools. Yeah, again, I mean, he can give that money to the Board of Ed. The board of, it's up to the Board of Ed to decide what they want to do with it because they are a psyched, a separate elected body. And there's a reason why they're a separate elected body because you keep, that keeps the politics from City Hall out of education. Mm -hmm. and there's a distinct reason why that's done. Um, so Mark gives himself an A-plus. He really doesn't deserve it. The other no. thing he does is he takes credit for things that... You shouldn't oh, take no, for. You, you, come on. <laughs> what do you mean by that? The, uh, the magnet school. Uh, oh, that was the done. On, that, he school. did that. He, that was his no, idea. No, he didn't. Okay. That was done. That was in the works. And the um, uh, Ellsworth Avenue School, uh, that whole transition, the uh, college being able to purchase 
the property. Uh, that was all done before he even became mayor. But what he did well, John, was an agreement with the board that when the, um, when the building was sold, uh, that the 600000 uh, from right. the sale would go to the Danbury Public Schools. And my God, they can use it. They can use it for textbooks. They can use it for technology. $600,000 can go a long way when yes. kids are sharing uh, chemistry books in, and that, in high and that, school. And that didn't happen as of yet. <laughs> you know, so. No, no. And the sale, has, the sale has already taken place. So, again, these are... We just touched on just a few topics in terms of education that, you know, again, as a parent who's putting her, his child through school, now I'm really, you know, it's just, you know, if you don't have a kid and you're not involved with the school system, you, you just don't pay attention to this stuff. This is real big time stuff that a lot of parents are like concerned about. I'm amazed over going to board of vet meetings or just hearing parents on the street saying, you know, I can't believe what's happening in my school. I'm losing this paraprofessional. The school, we're, mm -hmm. we're, they don't have enough textbooks. The school class size are like 25, 27. This is just ridiculous. And, you know, it, it comes down to homeowners paying property taxes. When you pay those property taxes, you're expecting there's some type of service in return. You know, fix my potholes and make sure that my kid gets a, a good education. But we all want high property values, and the only way that you get them in a community is by having high quality education. Absolutely. Really, uh, they're, they're so tied together. And I would hate to see uh, kids going to Broadview or kids going to Rogers Park on split sessions, the way I did in 1957 or 58, whenever it was that I started high school. <laughs> it was a long time ago, but it was the short-sightedness. Um, I'd love to see us hang on to the 13-acre parcel that's part of this year's budget um, for uh, another magnet school, for another middle school, so that we don't have the expense of having to go out and buy property. One, mm. one of the things, Mark has this task force, this 2020 task force, right. that's looking at um, school space needs. But it was the 2010 task force, and he didn't call them to meet. Right. Uh, for two years. He did, they just sat there. And what they're talking about is now, because the formulas have changed, um, of y using money to rent space. And renting space is fine if, if you're talking about renting it for uh, Board of Education. Uh, right administrative purposes. Renting is fine for a reach and rebound where you're going to have like a maximum of 50 kids. Right. But you cannot rent a facility for 900, 900 students and, and do it economically in Danbury. Right. I mean, that's, that's crazy. It doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense doing it and taking that approach to it. Um, for people who want to call in, if you want to call in, this is a live show, 203-792-4101. Um, Again, area code 203 seven nine two four one oh one i have here the democratic candidate for mayor lynn tabersack and we're talking about issues in danbury that will um play a role in this year's election and again if you don't vote you have no you have no reason to be bitching all right um we touched on a little bit you brought up al baker at the beginning of the um of the show mm -hmm. and i love talking about al baker um can you elaborate a little more on your feelings on Al Baker and his, his performance? First of all, he's from Wisconsin. Yes. Uh, don't you think we have uh, any homegrown talent uh, that could run uh, this police department? Well, I do. And I, I would say the same about possibly other department heads, that um, we do not need somebody from the Midwest uh, running our police department. There have been, uh, I think there have been a lot of complaints about the police palace that was... The, the, the place that's over 78 <laughs> degrees. <laughs> the, the place that has been, that has air conditioning that doesn't work, that right. has a firing range that, uh, that leaks. <laughs> it's raining. Um, uh, but also, um, uh, I, th I think that we need to seriously look at promoting from within and having a good, strong leader who has the respect of the entire department. Uh, I don't think he's, um, he's made himself at home here. I believe he's, he's a part-time police chief. I think he spends a lot of time going back and forth. This four-day work week has allowed many department heads 
the ability to go home on Thursday and actually not put down roots uh, in the city of Danbury. So I don't think um, I don't think he has he has a commitment uh, to the city and to seeing it run well. Yeah, I, I, you, you brought up the four-day work week, and it just it just it's something that me just goes like this because it, the, the, nothing drives me more nuts than the four-day work week. And for, <laughs> I mean, you can sit out. Um, at City Hall on Friday, I should I should do this one. I should go out to City Hall on Friday with a camera and watch how many people go like <laughs> to the door. <laughs> with the door. Yeah. But uh, we we got a call, so let's uh, see who this is. Hello there, you're on the air. Hello. Yes, go right ahead. Hey, uh, Al, how are you tonight? And uh, Mrs. Tabersack, how are you? Um, I just think that whatever happens, I think there needs to be some change in uh, 2012, the way uh, the city government operates terms of the council and the office of the mayor. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, the mayor constantly pounding the federal government, saying they can't get out of their way and uh, stick in the state of Hartford, the politicians of Hartford, which is democratically controlled. That doesn't help the city of Danbury when uh, it comes time to attract federal funds and state funds. Um, and uh, if you watched... Uh, face the uh, state where Mayor Belton was on recently. Um, he was pounding the Democrats for constantly raising taxes. Well, if you look at what Mr. Belton has done on his record for being in the mayor's office, um, every year he's been in office, he's raised taxes except for one. That was the year he ran for lieutenant governor. One more thing. Um, in terms of police uh, department property, I personally pushed for um, that to be developed for uh, for I wanted to be developed for quality low-income housing. It would have been very easy for the city government and Mayor Bowden to simply hand over that deed to Danbury Housing Authority for one dollar and say, hey, go out and um, um, uh, develop this property for low-income people, um, quality low-income housing to house um, our um, elderly, our disabled, and our veterans. Uh, thank you for taking uh, the time out to appear on uh, Marty Heiser's show with Al Robinson, guest host. And uh, thanks again. Hey, thanks Good luck. I really appreciate that call. Yeah, uh, he, he brought up a lot of great topics. I, we can go on. We will definitely touch on all these issues. Uh, other issues that are in my nerves, uh, low-income housing, or, or should I say affordable housing, mm -hmm. the location of the police station, where it's at, as opposed to maybe it should have been over at Kennedy Park, <laughs> you know, or the place that's still getting those, tax, yeah. those sweet tax breaks. He, he raised a, a very good points about um, uh, the mayor blasting Democrats for raising right. taxes, which they, which they did this session. I mean, right. everybody got gored. But he's raised taxes, except for that one, year, for one year, every single year. But he's raised um, sewer rates and water rates, and he's bonded. He's bonded um, uh, the city into oblivion, uh, so that so that he's criticizing the Democrats, and he's doing just as badly with uh, his spending. Yeah, I, I I don't know if you were in I don't know if you were on the council when this transpired, but I recall when he did five five hundred thousand dollar bonds. One was just below. He wanted oh, to make it look good, but it was on the same agenda. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. without go without seeking approval of voters. Yeah, in fact, you I, I don't think you were on the council. I think no. you I think what happened was, and this was an amazing thing that the mayor did. You tried to speak in, on on that wow. item on the agenda, and he said, "Well, that's not part of the agenda." That's not when part was, of the budget. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah. It's right yeah. there. So um, yeah, we, he raised the sewer and water rate. In fact, I think he jacked up sewer and water rates by a, 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 an incredible amount during his first term in office. Um, and you have the bonding that's going on constantly. So he's raised taxes almost every year in office except for lieutenant governor while we've been getting a decrease, in my opinion, in some of the quality of services that we need, specifically in education as well as some other areas. Um, let's talk a little bit about affordable housing if you, if you, if well, you want the, to. Well, the one other thing I wanted to comment on is um, the fact that the mayor did go on face the state quite oh. recently, and he's introduced as one of uh, Connecticut's top Republicans. He's one of Connecticut's top non-millionaire Republicans. But the fact that 
Um, Mark is looking for another job, and he's okay. got one foot out the door. Uh, he's he's uh, not going to run for Congress, but he is running for another job. And that's why he has paraded out all these ridiculous uh, issues. Um, first, he uh, saved us from the casino, from the Indians. Uh, uh, then he saved us from the mob when the, all the Galante stuff was... Uh, was uh, falling apart. While well, he's getting um, bundled campaign contributions. That's right. Yeah. Then he got into immigration like there was no tomorrow. And you have to say, why is he raising all of these like um, very divisive issues and, and uh, being a champion on them? It's because he's looking for another job, folks. Uh, and probably that job is governor of the state of Connecticut and is probably not, uh, you know, uh, it's not going to be next year. It'll be two years. It'll so be you're two saying years he, from now. he doesn't have a vested interest full time in the city of Danbury? No, he doesn't. He's using Danbury to bring out uh, wedge issues that will appeal to lots of voters. You talk about your parade ordinance, um, the sex offender ordinance, all of these things that um, don't work and that don't improve the quality of life. If anything, they make it. Um, they, they make the quality of life worse. Uh, I'm one of those people who stands at the War Memorial every Saturday. I've been doing it for five years. I'm a peace standee, so I stand for peace. And I think folks don't realize the messing around that the parade ordinance causes with our First Amendment rights, that we have to go to the police department and ask uh, every time we want to congregate on a street corner, no, that violates our constitutional rights. Right. And thank goodness nobody has taken the city to court yet because then we'd be spending more on litigation. That's the other thing besides the taxes and oh. the bonding. The money he's spending on things that, that really we don't have to spend money on. The settlements, the, the firefighter lawsuit, the, uh, the day laborers lawsuit. Right. Oh. We don't need to be spending money there. We can do better right. uh, with the schools. We can fund them adequately. We, we want to spend money wisely. We want to spend it on things that really make the quality of life better here. Yeah. Well, let's take another call real sure. quick here. Carly, you're on the show. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask Lynn. This is the good Lynn. Hi, good Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Lynn. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about the uh, senior housing and what you feel about it and the old police station lot and what happened to the seniors getting squashed down to hardly any units. And I just sadly learned that Mayor Eriquez is no longer at Union Savings Bank, or at least that's what I have heard. Yeah. Um, how is that going to affect uh, the seniors and what they're able to do uh, with the property there? Because we now have to wait for Mr. Maloney to get going with his health yeah, center before yeah. they even start to build the senior housing. Yeah. I don't know if you're familiar, but there's almost a 1,500 unit uh, deficit in the city of Danbury for senior housing. Mm -hmm. There was a wonderful book put out by EVCO that explains all of this, and I'd be glad to get you a copy if you'd like one. Oh, that's great. But, um, this, is, this is not the senior housing that uh, Lynn and Charlotte have been uh, oh, working for for what? Eight to ten years? Yes, uh, it is. Uh, no, uh, it, it, it isn't going to happen at that at the police at the old police station, and it's a shame. Yeah. My other question is: Have you heard about the dog park? Oh, of course, I have heard about the dog park. <laughs> Bad and ideas float that. right up to the uh, right up to the surface, and I know um, my uh, school friend uh, Margaret has been uh, diligently <laughs> pursuing that, and we need to. Uh, we need to remember that uh, your park, the Highland Avenue Park, is one of the few remaining neighborhood parks in the city of Danbury. When I was a kid, we had the Lions Playground at the corner of Locust Stand, Osborne, Osborne yeah. um, and, and there were others. Uh, we, really, we really don't need to give up an acre and a half of a local neighborhood park for dogs. Uh, mm -hmm. I have two dogs. There are lots of parks that I take them to, and I take my little bags with me. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I'm concerned about is he going to put them aside uh, until after election, and then it'll be winter, and there'll be no children down there, and then we'll ram it through. And 
how do we keep an eye on it and uh, keep this in front of the people so that mm -hmm. they don't throw the kids out for the dogs? Well, w one of the problems is the the fact that we do have a a mayor who runs everything, so that with his majority on the city council. He could get through anything that he wanted, Lynn, and that's very dangerous. And it's sad to attend council meetings and hearings and see the handful of people who come, always come and always speak and aren't listened to. Um, I don't know why there is so much apathy, but one of my suspicions is that when you have a mayor who controls everything, um, through his appointments, through being very much involved in everything, that there is no power for the people. Right. I thank you very much for running. <laughs> You're quite I, welcome. Um, I was afraid it was going to be an un contested contest and I'm glad you're there to bring out the point. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thanks a lot, Lynn. Yeah, um, the, the doggy park thing, I just want to touch back on that for a little bit because as somebody who was, in, in, and I think Lynn can attest to this, um, back when we didn't have any local broadcasting of the government meetings on TV, uh, and we, we, <laughs> I remember that. You remember that very they well. They were against it. They Mark were, was against it. Now he him, loved it. Him was against it. Joe Cava was against it. Now yeah. they they love it so much that they moved all the Republicans from one side of the of the dais to the other side. So <laughs> guess they can be on TV a lot more. Um, it, they fought that tooth and nail, and while at the same time they first tried to propose a doggy park uh, thing that would have cost I think it was fifteen thousand dollars to tax taxpayers, and here we are again. We're talking about a doggy park in which. I don't know who's talking about doggy parks nowadays, um, and the, the the park at Highland Park is being utilized by the by the residents in that in and, that neighborhood and by Moore Street School and by Moore Street Moore School Street as well. School is landlocked. It has yeah. a children's playground, but it doesn't have any fields. Right. I mean, you cannot deprive that community of that park. Um, yeah. and, and 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 now what you have here is like uh, it, the, the 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 ad hoc committee is being chaired by the Council Component. person from the seventh <laughs> ward, and she's out there saying, "Oh, this is great. This is all. This is." I'm like, "Are you representing? <laughs> are you representing the people in your ward? Are you representing the person who's in the third floor at, at City Hall here? Yes, exactly. You know, if you want a doggy park, why don't you go fight with the Terry Wild Park, uh, Terry Wild Park Authority and get a little doggy park over there? They got plenty of land over there. Yeah. You know, go do that. So, it just seems like there, there, there doesn't seem to be a lot of voice for the people on the council when it no. comes to these things that just doesn't make any sense, especially when you have a council person who is saying, this is a great idea for something that's happening in her and war, and the people are like, no, we don't want this. People don't want it, yeah. So um, again, if you want to call in, the number here is 792-4101. I have the Democratic candidate for mayor. She'll answer any questions you want about any topic. and. Uh, well, let's get back to um, economic I, development. I, I wanted to talk about economic development. That's that's a big, big problem. Um, you have irresponsible development that's happening in this area that I like to call it. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you, we still I, it still drives me nuts that BRT is getting a sweetheart deal with the free sewer hookups and the free tax giveaways for something. They say we're going to put this for you know affordable housing for young adults. They get the tax money. It's like, well, we'll just change it into a college dormitory. Yeah. You know, um, what are your thoughts in, in terms of economic development in Danbury? Well, it's got to be the very highest priority for the next administration. It really does. Um, for the past two years, that position has been part-time or empty. And I think that uh, Wayne Shepard uh, can't do economic development as a sideline. Right. I know that they're advertising the position, uh, that they hope to hire someone. I hope they're not looking in Wisconsin uh, for another <laughs> candidate to bring to us. But I think it's very important to try to create good jobs. And we don't have a lot of major employers in the city of Danbury. And um, a lot of the big employers that we have, aside from Danbury Hospital, are, are what I call quasi-public. You have Westcon. Um, you, have, um, you have the Danbury Public Schools. Um, they employ a lot of people. You have the city of Danbury. They employ a lot of people. We need to attract employers who can pay people decent wages. And we get the mayor out there cheerleading. We're bringing in Sonic 
Yeah. Well, it's <laughs> not only you? Sonic. I just couldn't get over how people effused over Chuck E. Cheese. I know it's a great place for birthday parties, <laughs> but someone who works at Chuck E. Cheese cannot buy a home and live in Danbury. Right. Uh, somebody who works at Wild Buffalo Wings can't buy a home and live in Danbury. Uh, we need people to have decent jobs. And uh, one of the ideas that um, I like to um, think about is that we do contract out. Uh, for certain services, whether it's landscaping or custodial services, why can't we make it a requirement that that the um, contracted services hire qualified Danbury residents? Um, I know unions hate residency requirements, but we need jobs for folks in Danbury and jobs that allow them to pay their mortgages, pay their taxes, send their kids to college. And um, we've got to do a better job um, making downtown a place where people want to come and spend time and spend money. I wanted to bring that up real quick. One of the big issues, I, I moved to Danbury back in 1987, a year after the Danbury Mall was opened. And from 1987 to now, the one thing I keep hearing is like, we need to do something about Main Street. We need to revitalize Main Street. We <laughs> We've done do it twice. We yeah. had a task force. We had a renaissance. Right. We've got a city center. We have more layers downtown than a uh, uh, cold winter night you would give you blankets. <laughs> but um, the, um, the problem is why, why do we have that empty space on Kennedy Boulevard uh, just sitting there? I know it's not a market for high-end uh, high-end luxury condos, but if any people from the area have ever been to Stu Leonard's down in Norwalk, it sits, it's bang right, right there on the Boston Post Road. Right. Um, why don't we look for a niche retailer like that? Why can't we bring a Trader Joe's downtown? Why can't we bring a Stu Leonard's downtown? Mm -hmm. And it would change the whole dynamic. Uh, but the other thing, and if you talk to some of the um, uh, downtown buffs, we aren't really capitalizing on the fact that the Still River uh, runs through the city. Absolutely. I know that, uh, believe it or not, I've seen a tall white egret um, uh, right near Meeker's Hardware in yeah. that part of the Still River. Uh, we need to capitalize on it, make space for um, uh, bookstores and cafes and parks. Yeah. We, don't, we don't have parks downtown where people can sit and just enjoy the outdoors, right. community gardens. Those are all things that can change the dynamics downtown. Yeah, it's, it's amazing that um, I recall during the 90s um, going down Main Street and I can actually go to, let's say, a Seattle Espresso and have a cup of coffee down there or, or read a book down at the Blue Moon uh, bookstore that was by the old the, the, uh, Peter Pan bus station. You know, there was actually places you can go and do things and now there's Nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty sad for a city that's the seventh largest city in the state of Connecticut. And we're still growing. And um, we're still you growing. know, we're up to 80,000, and I always like to say we can't get from one side of Danbury to the other. We haven't addressed the traffic problems. Uh, that makes it, the community unattractive, as do poor quality schools. Yeah. Fix these things, and we'll attract. All right, well, let's get to another call real quick here. <coughs> call, you are on the show. Oops. Call, you're on the show? Yes, sir. How are you? Good, good. Go right ahead. I got Lynn Tabersack here. I want to say hello to you and to Lynn. But I have to say, I don't quite understand when you talk about economic development, how you can say the city of Danbury, which leads the state in almost every economic indice, lowest unemployment rate, highest manufacturing percentage of jobs, retail mecca of the state of Connecticut. I could continue for an hour here, but please, when you're talking about economic development, do it in a way that is, you know, doesn't insult those of us who are out here doing it every day. Because I think you're, you're, you're just, you're losing, you're losing sight of what an incredibly successful city. And in, in the midst of one of these, longest and most depressing recessions All right. you, have you looked at what our economic what our, our, our uh, unemployment rate is lately it's not by accident 
All right, well, I'll, I'll, give, you know, I'll, I'll live, give Lynn an opportunity yeah. to respond to you, and yeah. thanks a lot for your call. As, as I said, I keep my hand in a lot of social service agencies, and I uh, had a chance to uh, give a mom a gas card uh, so that she could get to work, and she, she was ecstatic because her son, who hasn't worked in two years, got a job at Danbury Hospital. Um, he had to go through that uh, workforce training. He learned how to draw blood. But um, yes, we have great economic indicators. And on the other side, we have a lot of people who are falling through the cracks, who haven't worked, who are working two part-time jobs, who can't make ends meet, who can't pay their taxes. So no, it's not all pretty here in Danbury. And when you see a store like um, Dick's Sporting Goods that was empty for so long. It, it, it's a retail center, but a retail center doesn't help if people don't have money to spend in their pocket. And I want to be concerned not about people coming from Ridgefield and Brookfield to shop at the Danbury Fair Mall. I want to be concerned about whether or not Danbury residents have a good quality of life and have an opportunity to have a decent job that's not down in Stamford. Yeah, I think um, when you talk about the low unemployment rate in Danbury, I had an argument with somebody one time, and I said, you know, when you talk about, it, it's, it's hard for people to grasp this, when you talk about the low unemployment rate in Danbury, it, just because it, it doesn't mean you're actually working in Danbury. Oh, no, you're this not. Is, this is greater Dan, it, it's, it's greater Danbury. You're talking about Bessel, Ridgefield, Brookfield, the surrounding areas going down to Norwalk and to Stanford. Just because you have a low unemployment rate in Danbury doesn't necessarily mean that you people are working within Danbury. And if you look at some and of the, they're happy with their commutes. And if you look at yeah, and if you look at some of the jobs that are in Danbury that are not retail or fast food, we actually lost a lot of jobs. Although we were getting some back, we, we lost a lot of jobs over the, over, over time. Uh, companies have left this area. Um, but back on to economic development, I just want to touch again, just on Main Street real quick. I did an interview with a individual who was an owner of a consignment shop on Main Street that uh -huh. actually had to close up her shop. <laughs> because um, of parking. Because of parking. Yeah. It, parking seems to be a major problem on Main Street for a lot of, I, and after talking with her, I talked to other business owners around her place and said, yes, parking is a major problem. Yeah. Look out there on Main Street, all the parking spots are gone that used to be there. You know, what am I supposed to do to keep my business going? What would you do in terms of addressing the, the, the problems in, in, in relates to parking on Main Street to help out these, these retailers and, and business owners to keep their businesses going? Well, you know, communities um, need to look at the whole picture of their downtown and what they're doing about parking. I've been to some very interesting towns where uh, they'll have a meter that you turn uh, as soon as you park your car and you have 15 minutes free. Uh, if you want to park longer, you have to put money in it. But isn't that welcoming? You know, and, and how are we designing parking? Because people do like the convenience of getting out of their car and going directly into a store. Well, there's a, there's a music store that's the, that lost their parking spots. And you, what do you do? You got this big tuba <laughs> in the wintertime. <laughs> and you end up having to lug it. Yeah. Um, it's a catch-22 in some ways because I know that Barbara lost her parking spaces because the state, uh, this is a state road, Main Street is, right. what route is it? Uh, I can't tell you off the top of my head. Me um, neither, 37, 39, whatever route it is, that um, when they built the Bardo parking garage, they needed a specific sight line right. under state rules. And um, while you can't fight City Hall, there was no attempt uh, to modify that uh, so it would be agreeable to the existing businesses. All right, we've got another call here, so let's uh, just keep it going. Hello there, you're on the show with Lynn Tabersack. Go right ahead with your question, please. Yes, sir, you're on the show with Lynn Tabersack. Uh, just make sure you turn down your volume on your TV or else we get uh, feedback. Okay. Thank you. All right, no problem. I did that right now. Okay. Um, Lynn, um, I, I like the things that are... Uh, you're bringing up um, for the last quarter that said that we have great economic development. Um, he should look at the numbers because uh, most of the I lost. I had a good job in Danbury. I'm a Danbury resident. My name is Fidelio Acevedo. I own property. I pay taxes. Yeah. I had a good job two years ago. I worked for uh, um, material um, 
construction supply store here in Danbury. I don't want to name the business. Yeah. Um, but I worked there for two years. I had a good job. We delivered construction material all over the state, New York, Norwalk, Bedford Hills. And I lost my job, a very good job. And I was laid off for almost two years. Oh. And it, there, you could find a McDonald's job. You know, yeah. you could find a fast food job in Danbury, but the good paying jobs where you could, well, I almost lost my house, thank God I was able to get my mortgage lower, yeah. um, modified. But the good jobs in Danbury, they're not good manufacturing, good paying jobs, and that's the problem. And people gotta understand, you might think there's a low unemployment rate in Danbury, but Danbury is mainly a bedroom community. Mm -hmm. Most of the people, most of your residents that live in Danbury are working either in New York, mm -hmm. or working in Stanford, or working in Norwalk, so, I have a lot of friends that are between my age, uh, from 35 to 45, um, we're, um, we could say middle age now, and <laughs> there's just no good paying jobs in Danbury. We got to change know? that. So, thank you, and I hope uh, I'll work for you during the election. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much for your call. I do appreciate it. So, um, what do you say to that? That's the stories that we aren't hearing uh, from Mark Boughton, and they're the people that he's not seeing and, and Wayne Shepard aren't seeing. Uh, a, a, an unemployment statistic means nothing. Um, he's absolutely right. Uh, you know, I heard uh, from Hevco that we have this, the people who work in Danbury are, live in Naugatuck and people who work in Norwalk live in Danbury, that we're all commuting out of our, out of our home communities uh, yep. for those jobs. And uh, we need a better balance. Yeah. And we need to create good jobs for this man uh, so he can work near home and support his family. Um, again, going back to myself, I moved in here in 1987. One of the reasons I moved back in during the late 80s was to go to school at Westcom, but also back during that time, which is so long ago, there's a lot of accounting jobs, and you had Perkin Elmer down here, and there's those type of jobs down here. And then from there, once I graduated college, it was a great area to live because rent was cheap in Danbury, and you just cruise down Route 7, boom, you're in Norwalk, and boom, you're in Stanford, and that's... What a, or, or you can go over to Westchester. That's what a lot of people still do to this day. Mm -hmm. you know, so, but um, we have one more call. A lot of calls today. Call, you're on the air um, with Lynn Tiverside. Go right ahead with your question, please. Uh, and again, just make sure you turn on your, uh, your volume on your TV or else we get bad feedback. Go right ahead. Hello? Yes, go right ahead, please. You have a question. Yes, uh, Al, um, I, just, I just wanted to clarify something that, that Lynn just said. Again, if you're quoting Hebco's statistics on journey to work, over 70% of our regional residents that live in the greater Danbury area work in greater Danbury. So again, please, be careful with statistics and also get them right because we, we study these all the time. This, this is one of the highest percentages of people that live in a region, or even in the city of Danbury, that work in the city of Danbury. And, and to your point that we don't have, and we're not creating higher paying jobs, did you hear the announcement of Beringer Engelheim, the multi-million dollar expansion? There is another one coming. Did you hear about the expansion that's gonna happen at Goodrich, another 20,000 square foot? Bill? Did you hear about Barden hiring back hundreds of people. You please get please. You know you're you're, you're spreading. Uh, you know what you think is correct, but get the statistics and get the facts correct. Okay. Please. Well, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll allow um, Lynn to respond to those. You can do it, Al. I know you okay, can. Okay. I'm sure I can. Okay. No <laughs> problem. Being out in the street all the time and taping <laughs> the, the people. You can do that. Okay, well, let's, let's uh, let Len respond to all that. What do, what, do you say to, what do you say to that? Well, I think he missed the uh, caller that came in between his two calls. Uh, we, need, we need more people who haven't worked in the past two years who live in Danbury to call in. It, it isn't all that rosy. And um, I think that you are also quoting statistics. I mean, is 9.1% uh, good 
uh, unemployment is is 8.9 percent good is it different uh, is there a different rate for instance for young people who are uh, just coming out of college is there a different a higher rate for minorities in the city of Danbury um, yes statistics mm can tell any story that you want them to tell but yeah I'm gr I'm glad that the existing major employers are expanding we right. need more right and if I, you think that we can stop now and pull up the drawbridges you're wrong okay well um, we got a few more minutes here and I just want to touch on a few other topics because this is, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're getting a lot of calls but if you want to call in real quick uh, the, we have a few more minutes. But the number here is 203-792-4101, 203-792-4101. Okay, we talked about litigations and spending, well, spending money, money on that litigations we that, we, that, that we don't need to. And we have two big things that we spent money on, uh, one of which I followed for a very long time, and another one in which the city admitted to some type of wrongdoing, wrongdoing that we don't know what it is, we don't know what the remedy is, and unfortunately the News Times never followed up on the story in the first place. So why don't we touch first on the firefighters lawsuit real quick and just tell me briefly, uh, just inform people what that was all about and what happened. Uh, well, there, there was uh, an entry, um, there was an opening for um, entry-level firefighters in the city of Danbury, and you know, a list, uh, it's a civil service Position. So a list is drawn up. People have take a written test. Uh, they come in for an interview, and they're all ranked. And what happened was in in uh, this particular case is that people who didn't rank as well, who weren't as qualified, were selected before people who were more qualified. Mm -hmm. And so they sued. And you know, there was much thrashing and moaning and saying, we're going to fight this to the end, we did nothing wrong, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. and uh, ended up settling uh, and, and reinstating uh, people who should have been chosen in the first place. And we, I know that they admitted to some type of wrongdoing. I still don't really know what the wrongdoing was, who was, who was responsible for the wrongdoing. I don't know what the remedy was. They didn't to, follow their civil service rules. Yeah, it's, it seems like you know we wasted a lot of money on this thing that in the end it just hurts us in the end as a city. Well, you know, if uh, Mark is running everything, he maybe he ought to try running the Civil Service Commission um, the way it's supposed to be run. He could get involved and and one more quick thing before we go, and I just wanted to bring this up real quick. We were told back when this, when I'm talking about the Danbury 11 case, that Mayor, the Mayor Bowton said on different media outlets, on multiple different occasions with different reporters, and then, verif and then a year later talking to the Fairfield Weekly saying, I, I, what I said back then is, is, is my statement, that Danbury played no role in the, 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 the situation that happened down there at Kennedy Park. Now, years later, do you think that the mayor was like misleading the people when he said this? Absolutely. I can't, I can't imagine anyone in Danbury who would think that uh, the Danbury Police Department would act without his knowledge on, on, a, um, on a proposition like this. And I think settling the lawsuit kind of confirms that. Uh, yeah. You could go on and on and on in the courts, but, but why be involved in that Thank you all for watching today. We have